Okay. Good day, everybody. Welcome to our next episode of the Dissection of the Human Brain. I am Dr. Sanjay Sanyal, Professor and Course Director of Neuroscience, and the camera person is Mr. Mark Lesser, our IT Administrator. Today I shall demonstrate all that we need to know about the cerebellum. So what do you see in front of you, which I'm holding, this is the cerebellum attached to the brainstem. First, let me give you a quick overview of how the structures are disposed. This is the medulla, this is the pons, and this is part of the midbrain. The rest of the midbrain has been, has been removed while it was being removed from this cadaver. And if you notice that this is the anterior part, and stuck to the dorsal aspect of the posterior part of the brainstem is the cerebellum here. This whole thing is the cerebellum. So therefore, the cerebellum is attached to the dorsal aspect of the pons and the medulla. So this is the orientation of the cerebellum in the lateral view. This is the orientation of the cerebellum in the anterior view. And this is the view of the cerebellum from the posterior aspect. Now that we have seen the orientation of the cerebellum, now let's see how the cerebellum is located in situ in the cranial cavity. For that, I need to show you the cranial cavity itself. This is the base of the skull, and this is the posterior cranial fossa. You can see the cerebellum is located here. The cerebellum sits like this. Therefore, this depression that you see in the posterior cranial fossa, these are known as the cerebellar fossa. And this groove that you see, this is where the tentorium cerebelli is attached. So therefore, this is the infratentorial compartment which houses the cerebellum. This is the foramen magnum through which this medulla passes out. So this is the orientation of the cerebellum. So now that we have noticed, we have seen how the cerebellum is disposed in the cranial cavity, we understand immediately something. The cerebellum is like a thick disc. It has got a superior surface. It has got an inferior surface. The superior surface is the one which is separated from the occipital lobe of the brain by the tentorium cerebelli. So therefore, the tentorium cerebelli is here. And the inferior surface, this is the inferior surface, is which is the one which is resting on the posterior cranial fossa infratentorial compartment or the cerebellar fossa. In fact, if you look at the cranial cavity much more closely, you might see some grooves on the floor. Those are known as the brain markings caused by the cerebellar grooves. In this particular specimen, they are not so obvious. So this is the orientation of the cerebellum. Now let's take a look at the, the parts of the cerebellum. The cerebellum has got two hemispheres. We are looking at the cerebellum from the posterior aspect. So this is one hemisphere, this is one hemisphere. And joining the two hemispheres, we have a midline structure, which you can see here. This is the vermis. Now, quite often students have asked me this question. Is the vermis like the corpus callosum of the brain? No, the simple answer is the vermis is not like the corpus callosum of the brain. The vermis is got the same structure as the cerebellar hemispheres. Only thing is it has got less of the cortex matter, which we shall see a little later. It is not like the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum, on the other hand, is a thick sheet of white matter which joins the two cerebral hemispheres. So therefore, vermis is not the same as the corpus callosum. Now let's take a look at the surface at the appearance of the cerebellum. For, for the sake of description, what I have done, I have removed the pyometer. Otherwise, the pyometer is the one which covers the surface and which cover, has all the blood vessels. And therefore, unfortunately, by removing it, we have also had to remove the blood vessels. But we immediately notice that the cerebral surface has got multiple grooves. This is the purpose of this is to increase the surface area of the cerebellar cortex. And these each individual structure fold that you see here, they are referred to as the cerebellar folia. The purpose is, single purpose is to increase the surface area of the cortex. And as a result of this, the cerebellum, though it is tightly packed in such a small compartment in the posterior cranial fossa, it has got more number of neurons than the cerebrum, which was contrary to what was known earlier. In fact, the word cerebellum means little brain. Previously, it was thought that it's a small brain, it's a little brain, it's silent brain, but now as more and more research is being done, it's being realized that the cerebellum, in fact, perhaps is even as important, if not more important than the cerebrum itself. Okay, that's so much for research. Now let's take a look at the fissures and the lobes, the anatomical lobes of the cerebellum. If we look at the posterior border of the cerebellum, the one which is butting against the occipital bone, 
The posterior border, there is a horizontal fissure here. So this is the horizontal fissure. We can see it clearly here. This is the horizontal fissure. It's a very deep fissure. And this horizontal fissure runs on the posterior aspect and it divides the cerebellum into a superior surface and an inferior surface, which we have already alluded to. So this is the horizontal the, the fissure. Now let's take a look at the superior surface. We see a V-shaped fissure here. This fissure here. This V-shaped fissure divides the cerebellum into a V-shaped anterior anatomical lobe and the rest of the cerebellum partly on the superior surface and partly on the inferior surface. The whole thing is referred to as the posterior lobe. Some books also call it the middle lobe. So this is the anterior anatomical lobe. This is the posterior or the middle lobe which extends from the superior surface to the inferior surface. And finally, I'm going to turn the cerebellum over like this and turn it around like this. We see another fissure deep here. To show you better, this fissure, this fissure. This is known as the uvulary, uvulonodular fissure. And this demarcates one small lobe of the cerebellum, which is referred to as the flocculonodular lobe. Then this is the flocculonodular lobe. So to repeat, superior surface, we have the, we have the primary fissure, anterior anatomical lobe, the middle or the posterior lobe, and finally on the inferior surface, anteriorly we have the uvulonodular fissure demarcating the flocculonodular lobe. So these are the anatomical lobes of the cerebellum. Now, traditionally, this anatomical lobe used to be referred to as the spinocerebellum. However, that classification has changed somewhat. I'm going to tell you the new classification just now. The anterior anatomical lobe was referred to as the spinocerebellum because it received maximum connections from the spinal cord. The middle of the posterior lobe is, used to be referred as the neocerebellum or the cerebrocerebellum and phylogenetically the newest part of the cerebellum because it has got extensive connections with the cerebral cortex and the flocculonodular lobe, the flocculonodular lobe is the phylogenetically the oldest part and this is referred to as the vestibulocerebellum. Now what we'll do, we will classify the cerebellum according to its current functional classification. For that, I have to include the vermis also in my description. So the current functional classification is as follows. This is the region of the vermis, the midline vermis. It goes, extends from the superior surface and goes all the way to the inferior surface. There we see the vermis deep inside. So this whole vermis is referred to as the vermal region or the spinocerebellum. Vermal region or the spinocerebellum. This whole vermis is concerned with controlling the axial or the truncal musculature and the proximal limb musculature. Now, if we look just on either side of the vermis, approximately where my index finger is located, on this side, and approximately where my index finger is located on this side, again extending on the superior surface down to the inferior surface. That portion is known as the paravermal region because it is on either side of the vermis. It is also referred to as the intermediate part of the hemisphere, here and here. This is also the spinocerebellum, but this is concerned with controlling the tone of the distal musculature, the distal parts of the limb, their muscle tone is being controlled. Then we have the remaining part of the cerebral hemispheres, this whole thing here and the whole thing here. This is referred to as the cerebrocerebellum or the neocerebellum or the pontocerebellum. This is the, as I said, the phylogenetically oldest part of it. And this is concerned with most of the activities of the cerebellum, namely motor planning, coordination, volitional movement, fine tuning, correction of movement errors, all these things are done by the cerebrocerebellum. And finally, the last functional component of the cerebellum is the same one which I had mentioned earlier, the flocculonodular lobe. This is concerned with posture, balance, and smooth pursuit eye movement, and it is also referred to as the vestibulocerebellum. So this is the current functional classification of the cerebellum. Having said the functional classification, let me give you a quick overview of the blood supply of the cerebellum. Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, I had to remove the pia mater and therefore most of the blood vessels have been removed. But to understand the blood supply, we'll have to look at it with the brainstem in its location. This is the medulla, this is the pons, and this is part of the midbrain. So running from here, from the medulla, 
one blood vessel goes all the way to the back of the cerebellum on the inferior surface. That is known as the PICA, posterior inferior cerebellar artery. It comes from the vertebral artery and it supplies this area. It also supplies the medulla, but we are concerned with the cerebellum right now. Then there's another artery which is also coming from this location in the pons and it's coming and supplying the inferior but the anterior part of the cerebellum. That is known as the AICA, anterior inferior cerebellar artery. This arises from, this is the first branch of the basilar artery which runs on the basilar groove of the pons. So this is the AICA and this is the PICA. And finally, supplying the superior surface of the cerebellum is an artery which is arising also from the basilar artery but runs like this and supplies the superior surface that is known as the superior cerebellar artery. So therefore we have the PICA, the AICA and the SCA. These are the three principal arteries of the cerebellum which supplies the cerebellum and these three arteries are very important. They produce lots of stroke syndromes of the brainstem but they also produce cerebellar manifestations. Coming to a quick word about the venous drainage. The venous drainage of the cerebellum is best understood by considering the lateral veins and the median veins, superior surface, inferior surface. So the superior lateral veins, they drain into a venous sinus which is running here. That is known as the superior petrosal sinus. The inferior lateral veins, they drain into a venous sinus which is running here. That is known as the inferior petrosal sinus. Coming to the median veins, the superior median vein it drains into a vein which runs here, that is known as the great cerebral vein of Galen. And finally, the inferior median vein, it drains into a vein which runs here, that is called the straight sinus. So these are the venous drainage of the cerebellum. Now we come to the next part, the peduncles of the cerebellum, which we can see in this specimen here. The cerebellum, as I said in the beginning, is attached to the dorsal aspect of the brainstem, namely the medulla and the pons, and also to the midbrain. It is attached by means of three pairs of pillars. Each pillar is referred to as a peduncle. And because it is attached to the cerebellum, these peduncles are referred to as the cerebellar peduncles. Let's look at, look at the first peduncle, which is easily obvious in this, in this specimen here. The largest and the most prominent peduncle that we see here. This is the middle cerebellar peduncle. As we can see, it is extending all the way from the pons and it is merging into the cerebellum. This is the middle cerebellar peduncle. This is by far the largest peduncle and it carries most of the input to the cerebellum from the cerebral cortex in the form of tracts which are known as the cortico-ponto-cerebellar tracts. This is the largest input to the neocerebellum, cortico ponto cerebellar tracts through the middle cerebellar peduncle. This connects the pons to the cerebellum. Having said that, now let me show you the, the inferior peduncle. If we move the medulla to one side, we notice that there is a pillar which is extending up from here. A pillar which is extending up this is the inferior cerebellar peduncle. This inferior cerebellar peduncle connects the medulla to the cerebellum. And finally, we have the superior cerebellar peduncle. To understand the superior cerebellar peduncle, I have to show you the midbrain. This is the midbrain. So this is the superior cerebellar peduncle. This side and on this side, this is the superior cerebellar peduncle on this side. This is the superior cerebellar peduncle. So now let's come to what are the structures which are running through the superior, middle and inferior cerebellar peduncle. Middle cerebellar peduncle I've already mentioned, it is the largest input to the cerebellum and the input is the cortico ponto cerebellar tract, the largest input to the neocerebellum. What about the inferior cerebellar peduncle? The inferior cerebellar peduncle carries the spinocerebellar tracts to the cerebellum, the cuneocerebellar tracts to the cerebellum. So these are all afferent tracts to the cerebellum, but it also gives rise to a few efferent tracts which are coming out of the cerebellum, namely the vestigio-vestibular tract, the vestigio-reticular tract, and the vestibulo-cerebellar tract. They also go through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. That is why the inferior cerebellar peduncle has been subdivided into 
or two components, a restiform body and a juxta restiform body. The restiform body is the one which gives all the afferents to the cerebellum from the spinal cord. And the juxta restiform body is the one which brings out the efferents out of the cerebellum, namely the vestigio vestibular and the vestigio reticular tracts. Coming to the middle cerebellar, superior cerebellar peduncle. The superior cerebellar peduncle is the main outflow. The superior cerebellar peduncle is the main outflow from the deep nuclei of the cerebellum. The deep nuclei of the cerebellum, most important of them is the dentate nucleus. The second largest is the globose emboliform nucleus. They all give their outflow tracts through the cerebellum, through the middle cerebellar peduncle. And these structures, they cross inside the midbrain at a structure which is known as the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncles. And they go to the opposite side, VL nucleus of the thalamus and the red nucleus of the midbrain. And thereafter, they go to many other places. So these are the three set pairs of peduncles which connect the cerebellum to the brainstem. Okay, so this is the first part of our dissection. And in the second part of our dissection, I'm going to show you the sagittal view. So if there are any questions or comments, please put it in the, question, in the comment section below. Have a nice day. Cerebellum is located in posterior cranial fossa and it lies behind the brain stem. The brain system consists of midbrain, pons and medulla. And with this brain stem, it is connected by three cerebellar peduncles connected to midbrain by superior cerebellar peduncle with pons by middle cerebellar peduncle and connected to medulla by inferior cerebellar peduncle. Anatomically, cerebellum is divided into three lobes anterior lobe which is also called as paleocerebellum then posterior lobe which is called as neocerebellum and floculonodular lobe so the three lobes are there in cerebellum anatomically the first one is the anterior lobe or paleocerebellum which is separated from posterior lobe or neocerebellum by primary fissure. So this is the primary fissure. And this posterior lobe has got another fissure that runs across the posterior lobe and this fissure is called as horizontal fissure and this horizontal fissure across the posterior lobe divides the cerebellum into two surfaces one is the superior surface and the another surface is the inferior surface which rests on which rests on the base of the skull this floculonodular lobe is also called as archi cerebellum so to repeat again the cerebellum is anatomically divided into Paleocerebellum, which is anterior lobe, neocerebellum, which is posterior lobe, and archicerebellum, which is floculonodular lobe. Physiologically or functionally, <coughs> cerebellum is divided into spinocerebellum, cerebro 
cerebellum and vestibulo cerebellum the spino cerebellum comprises of vermis which is this midline structure and lateral to the vermis is paravermis and lateral to paravermis is the cerebro cerebellum so this is the cerebro cerebellum part and functionally or physiologically the floculo nodular lobe is called as vestibulo cerebellum since it has got connections with the vestibular apparatus or vestibular nuclei the spino cerebellum it is called spino cerebellum because it receives the tracts from the spinal cord and these tracts are anterior spino cerebellar tract and posterior spino cerebellar tract that come from the lower part of the trunk and from the lower limbs and in the it also receives the tract from the upper limbs and these tracts are called as cuneo cerebellar tract and rostral spino cerebellar tract the area which is lateral to the paravermis is called as cerebro cerebellum because it receives the tracts from the cerebral cortex and it sends the uh, tracts to cerebral cortex so it is connections are mainly with the cerebral cortex that is why it is called as cerebro cerebellum and the third part is physiologically called as vestibulo cerebellum which is floculo nodular lobe and this is called vestibulo cerebellum because it receives and gives the tract to vestibular nuclei the three divisions that is vestibulo cerebellum spino cerebellum and cerebro cerebellum the vestibulo cerebellum controls whole body posture balance and equilibrium as well as it controls eye movements the spino cerebellum controls smooth conduction of body movements and cerebro cerebellum is involved in planning and programming of movements in collaboration with cerebrum vestibulo cerebellum receives the vestibular vestibulo cerebellar tract from vestibular nuclei of medulla which in turn receives the fibers from vestibular apparatus found in internal ear and here we see that vestibulo cerebellum is made of nodule and floculus the nodulus 
area you can see is in alignment with the vermis and we know that vermis contains the vestigial nucleus therefore vestibulo cerebellum is mainly associated with vestigial nucleus any track that that is received by vestibulo cerebellum or any tract that goes out of vestibulo cerebellum is basically coming or going uh, with connection to vestigial nucleus as i said the vestibulo cerebellum receives the vestibulo cerebellar tract from vestibular nuclei which is situated in the upper part of medulla and this vestibular nuclei in turn receives the fibers from vestibular apparatus and this vestibular apparatus is located in the internal ear and this vestibular apparatus contains semicircular canals it also contains atrial and sacral and fibers that arise from the vestibular apparatus first form the vestibular ganglia and from this vestibular ganglia the vestibular nerve enters the internal aquastic canal and then it enters and ends up in the vestibular nuclei and it is the vestibular apparatus that gives information about the positions of the head and about the movements of the head to the vestibular nuclei and then to the vestibulo cerebellum now as i said that vestibular nerve receives its fibers from the vestibular apparatus which is in the internal ear and then the vestibular nerve through the internal aquastic canal and reaches the vestibular nuclei in the upper part of the medulla and from the vestibular nuclei the fibers go to floculo nodular lobe or they go to vestibulo cerebellum through inferior cerebellar peduncle and these fibers end up in vestigial nucleus in the vestibulo cerebellum and vestibulo cerebellum also sends back fibers to vestibular nuclei so the ingoing tract is vestibulo cerebellar tract and outgoing is cerebello vestibular tract and from the vestibular nuclei now the fibers descend downwards as medial vestibulo spinal fibers which go to the cervical cord and lateral vestibulo spinal fibers which go to thoracic lumbar and sacral cord and through these fibers the muscles are either contracted or relaxed so that a desired posture is achieved and patient remains in balance the vestibulo cerebellum also receives visual input so the visual input will come from the field 
frontal eye field from frontal eye field and also from superior colliculi and from other visual areas of cerebral cortex and this will reach to pontine nuclei by cerebropontine tract and from pontine nucleus it goes to other side of the vestibulo cerebellum so this tract will be called as cerebro ponto cerebellar tract information about motion equilibrium and special orientation that is orientation of head neck and body is provided by vestibular apparatus which is in internal ear which includes a trickle saccule and three semicircular canals as we have known the atricle and saccule detect gravity that is information in a vertical orientation so the atricle and saccule detect gravity and linear movement the semicircular canals detect rotational movement if you look at this diagram you find the semicircular canals that is vestibular apparatus which is in the internal ear sends the message to vestibular nuclei about the position posture and movement of head and neck and this message is then sent to vestibulo vestibulo cerebellum and vestibulo cerebellum sends back message so there is to and fro connection between vestibular nuclei and vestibulo cerebellum and the tracts are vestibulo cerebellar tract and cerebello vestibular tract then from the vestibular nuclei the tracts are sent to spinal cord as medial vestibulo spinal tract and lateral vestibulo spinal tract medial vestibulo spinal tract ends up in cervical cord and lateral vestibulo spinal cord spinal tract and in thoracic and lumbar regions of the cord and it is through the through these tracts that position and movement of the neck as well as movements of the eye are adjusted and readjusted according to the need so that a balance and equilibrium is maintained between the head and the body and in relation to the surroundings and the space now you will be asking me how the movements of i are controlled by the vestibulo cerebellum if you look at this image again from the vestibular apparatus vestibular nerve enters into the vestibular nuclei and vestibular nuclei gives the vestibulo spinal tract that goes down into the spinal cord you will also see here that this vestibular nuclei gives connection to medial longitudinal fasciculus so this area here is medial longitudinal fasciculus 
and this medial longitudinal fasciculus is in the midline of the brain stem that is it there is there is this tract in the midline and it extends from medulla pons and midbrain and this medial longitudinal fasciculus it is attached by fibers to the tactum or in other words it gives the connection to tactum the tactum is found in the midbrain and it is the dorsal portion of or posterior portion of the midbrain where you which contains the tectum contains superior colliculus and inferior colliculus and superior colliculus is meant for vision and inferior colliculus is meant for uh, is meant for auditory sensations so it is here that you will find the tectum in the midbrain and the medial longitudinal fasciculus which receives the connection from vestibular nuclei and this medial longitudinal fasciculus is connected to the tectum that means it is connected to the superior colliculus and inferior colliculus that are concerned with auditory sensation and visual sensation or auditory control and visual control uh, by inferior colliculus and superior colliculus respectively and this medial longitudinal fasciculus is also connected to third fourth and sixth cranial nerves so vestibular nuclei is well connected to the eye through third fourth sixth uh, nerve nuclei which are connected to superior uh, which which have got connections to to superior and inferior colliculi as well as to medial longitudinal fasciculus and the the eye movements are controlled in response to visual as well as auditory stimuli and also in response to head and neck movements and position of head and neck and it is through these connections that these eye movements are controlled i show you again here this is the vestibular nuclei which has connection with vestibulo cerebellum and this vestibular nuclei is connected to medial longitudinal fasciculus and medial longitudinal fasciculus is connected to third fourth and sixth nerve nuclei and is this medial longitudinal fasciculus is also connected to tectum which contains a superior and inferior colliculi which by these connections control the movements of eye through third fourth and sixth cranial nerve and these movements of eye in relation to the position and movements of the head as well as in 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 response to in response to visual and auditory stimuli is controlled by these tracts that is by uh, medial longitudinal fasciculus as well as by vestibular vestib vestibular cochlea and vestibulo cerebellum so to repeat it again the vestibular nuclei is connected to medial longitudinal fasciculus which is in the midline of the brain stem extending through medulla pons and midbrain and this medial longitudinal fasciculi fasciculus is connected to third nerve the fourth nerve and the sixth nerve and this medial longitudinal fasciculus is also connected to superior inferior colliculi of tectum of the midbrain 
and once the message is given to to tactal area of mid brain that is tectum of the mid brain by vestibular nuclei through medial longitudinal fasciculus the tectum then sends the message through a tract down into the spinal cord and that goes up to the cervical cord so that this message is delivered to the muscles of the neck as well as to to the muscles of the head and this can bring increased tone or decrease in tone in various muscles of the head and neck so that the equilibrium and position is adjusted or readjusted according to the eye movements or according to the surrounding and the spatial orientation in other words the head and neck movements are mainly controlled by tecto spinal tract which comes from the tectum of the mid brain to cervical spinal cord now what have we learned about vestibulo cerebellum the vestibulo cerebellum in we have learned that vestibulo cerebellum in association with the vestibular nuclei cerebral cortex and in association with brain stem and spinal cord control the equilibrium and posture and and position of the head and neck and body so we have learned that vestibulo cerebellum controls the equilibrium and posture of head and neck especially and of the body as well as it controls and influences eye movements this it do, this it does through extra perimetral tracts like tecto spinal tract and vestibulo spinal tract and also in association with medial longitudinal fasciculus also in association with third fourth and sixth nerves as well as in association with superior and inferior colliculus of tectum of mid brain and it is through these extra perimetral tracts that some muscles of head and neck as well as other parts of body are inhibited or stimulated contracted or relaxed or their tone is increased or decreased so as to adjust or readjust postures and so as to maintain balance and equilibrium as and when required and lesions to these connections or areas can result in extreme disturbance of equilibrium and posture of head and neck as well as disturbance in the movements of eyes which may result in nystagmus and vertigo and there won't be awareness of head and neck orientation in relation to space and surroundings which will be impaired if there is something wrong in these connections or something is wrong in vestibulo cerebellum which will result then in vertigo the symptoms of vestibulo cerebellar syndrome which can occur due to the due to these connections or due to the vestibulo cerebellum will vary among patients but are typically unique combination of ocular abnormalities including nystagmus poor or absent smooth pursuit of movements that is ability of eyes to follow a moving object there can be strabismus that is misalignment of eyes or it may result in scadic eye movements that is discontinuous jerky eye movements on following moving objects there can be diplopia 
or there there may be vestibular ocular reflex that is reflex eye adjustment to stabilize gaze gaze during head movement or it may often be accompanied by nausea and vomiting so postural orientation and alignment of the trunk with head and neck with respect to gravity and surroundings and space get disturbed coordination of movements movement coordination of movement strategies to stabilize body and equilibrium is impaired the medial longitudinal fasciculus or tract is one on each side of the brain stem as we have known which is situated near the midline of the brain stem and composed of both ascending and descending fibers that arise from number of sources and terminate in different areas medial longitudinal fasciculus is the main central connection for the vestibular nuclei for the cerebellum and for oculomotor nerve trochlear nerve and abducens nerve as well as tectum of midbrain containing superior and inferior colliculus medial longitudinal fasciculus connects and integrates all these structures to achieve desired movements as well as desired position of head and neck and eye movements vestibular cerebellum is connected to these areas through connection to medial longitudinal fasciculus as we know tracts also come from tectum as tectospinal tract and innervate muscles of the neck and upper limbs so does vestibular spinal tract the clinical significance of medial longitudinal fasciculus is that a lesion in medial longitudinal fasciculus produces slowed or absent movements of ipsilateral eye usually associated with involuntary jerky eye movements that is nystagmus and it may result in internuclear ophthalmoplegia that is paralysis of the eye movements as we now know that ascending tracts arise from vestibular nuclei and terminate in third fourth and sixth nuclei which are important for visual tracking now coming to another functional division of cerebellum we got here spino cerebellum and this spino cerebellum consists of vermis which is in the midline and lateral to the vermis this part is the paravermis and lateral to paravermis is the area or is the cerebellar hemisphere which is called as cerebro cerebellum as i already said that this area is connected to cerebral cortex mainly there are number of nuclei in the spino cerebellum in the vermis is the vestigial nuclei and in the paravermis is nucleus interpositus this nucleus interpositus is made up of two nuclei called as globus nuclei and emboliform nuclei and lateral these two together are called as interpositus nuclei and lateral to this interpositus nuclei mainly in the cerebro cerebellum is the dentate nucleus so dentate nucleus is the farthest and close in the midline is the vestigial nuclei and between these two is the interpositus nucleus or intermediate nucle nucleus which consists of globus nucleus and emboliform nucleus 
So the vestigial nuclei and interpositus nuclei they belong to supinocerebellum and dentate nucleus belongs to cerebrocerebellum and if you see here in the vestibulocerebellum which consists of nodule this nodule is connected to the spinocerebellum so it is nucleus will be vestigial nucleus the lateral part of this vestibulocerebellum is almost free and is called as folliculus so it is not related or in association with other nuclei other than the vestigial nuclei now let us understand what tracts go to spinocerebellum before i come to this point let me tell you that there are conscious ascending tracts which are in the dorsal column this these tracts are also called as dorsal medial lemniscal tract and these tracts carry sensation of touch and vibration these tracts they ascend upwards and end up in the thalamus then from the thalamus this tract goes to post central gyrus where the sensation of touch or vibration is perceived there are also unconscious ascending tracts and these unconscious ascending tracts are anterior spinocerebellar tract and posterior spinocerebellar tract as the name suggests that these tracts they go to spinocerebellum you can see here anterior spinocerebellar tract and posterior to this is posterior spinocerebellar tract and these two tracts lie at the periphery of lateral funiculus this is lateral funiculus which is lateral to lateral horn it is here lateral funiculus lateral to lateral horn and it is at the periphery of this lateral funiculus or you can say lateral segment of the spinal cord that you see anterior spinocerebellar tract and posterior spinocerebellar tract the posterior spinocerebellar tract and anterior spinocerebellar tract they come from the lower part of the trunk and lower limbs and posterior spinocerebellar tract it carries the proprioceptive sensation and it monitors the length and tension in the muscles as well as carries the joint sense the anterior spinocerebellar tract carries the crude touch and pressure and some books say that this tract also carries some proprioceptive sensation but 
mainly the anterior supinocerebellar tract carries the crude touch sensation of crude touch and pressure and this anterior and posterior supinocerebellar tract ascends upwards and go to the spinocerebellum and we know that in spinocerebellum is the vestigial nucleus and interpositus nucleus so this tract makes connection with spinocerebellum so the anterior and posterior spinocerebellar tracts they enter into the spinocerebellum which is made of vermis and paravermis it is here in spinocerebellum that spinocerebellar tracts are connected as we have noted that it is anterior spinocerebellar tract and posterior spinocerebellar tract from the lower trunk and lower limbs it is this tract that goes to spinocerebellum from the lower limbs the posterior spinocerebellar tract actually arises from muscle spindles and golgi tendon organs which are situated in the muscle and at the tendons and these structures the muscle spindles and golgi tendon organs they give information about the state of contraction of muscles about their tension pressure and length as well as about the joint sense and this information is carried by the posterior spinocerebellar tract that goes through the posterior root then through the posterior root ganglion or dorsal root ganglion and then enter into the spinal cord here we should understand that this tract does not cross to other side of the spinal cord in a steed they ascend upwards along the same side to reach the upper part of the medulla and from the upper part of the medulla they go to the spinocerebellum through inferior cerebellar peduncle the other tract is anterior spinocerebellar tract and this tract also comes from the lower part of the trunk and lower limbs and also arises from the golgi tendon organs and muscle spindles but this tract mainly carries the sensation of crude touch and pressure some books write that it also carries the information about the proprioceptive sensations but let me stress here that most of the books write that it carries the sensation of crude touch and pressure from the lower limbs and this tract goes through the posterior root and through the posterior root ganglia or dorsal root ganglia and from here they enter the spinal cord but here 
we should understand that this tract crosses to other side of the spinal cord and after crossing to other side of the spinal cord it ascends upwards through the medulla and pons to reach the lower part of the midbrain and from the lower part of the midbrain it again crosses to other side it again crosses uh, crosses to reach the cerebellum of the same side and therefore this tract is double crosser it crosses first at the level of spinal cord and then it crosses at the level of lower part of the midbrain as i said that from the lower part of the midbrain it goes through the superior cerebellar peduncle to reach the spino cerebellum of the same side so this double crossing is actually needed to make the tract to reach the same side of spino cerebellum area to repeat again you can see here the posterior spino cerebellar tract arising from the golgi tendon organs and muscle spindles go through the dorsal root and dorsal root ganglia to enter the spinal cord and then it ascends upwards without crossing to other side of the spinal cord it passes upwards and reaches the medulla and in the medulla it enters the inferior cerebellar peduncle to reach the spino cerebellum of the same side of the body so if i show again here so one tract is posterior spino cerebellar tract which carries the sensation proprioceptive sensation and it ascends upwards without crossing and enters the spino cerebellum through the inferior cerebellar peduncle while as the anterior spino cerebellar tract has crossed to the other side of the spinal cord then it ascends upwards then again crosses and then enters through the superior cerebellar peduncle into the spino cerebellum this anterior spino cerebellar tract carries mainly the sensation of crude touch and pressure so one tract does not cross at the level of spinal cord the other tract crosses at the level of spinal cord as well as at the level of the midbrain so that was about the proprio septu sensation from the lower part of the trunk and lower limbs now what happens in the upper limbs so upper limbs we don't call them as uh, anterior and posterior spino cerebellar tracts but we call them as cuneo cerebellar tract and rostral spino cerebellar tract the cuneo cerebellar tract from the upper part of the trunk and upper limbs 
arises from Golgi tendon organs and muscle spindles carrying the sensation of sensation of tension state of contraction length of muscles and joint sense and this cuneo cerebellar tract goes into the dorsal root and dorsal root ganglia then it go enters the spinal cord and without crossing it ascends upwards and then through the inferior cerebellar peduncle it enters the spino cerebellum if i summarize here i said that from the lower part of the trunk and lower limbs arises anterior spino cerebellar tract and posterior spino cerebellar tract the anterior spino cerebellar tract carries the proprioceptive sensation and this tract after crossing the spinal cord ascends upwards and reaches the midbrain and from the midbrain it crosses again to reach the spino cerebellum of the same side of body and in the upper limbs we call it as rostral spino cerebellar tract and this tract also enters the spino cerebellum through superior cerebellar peduncle and both rostral spino cerebellar tract and anterior spino cerebellar tract carries mainly the sensation of crude touch and pressure as well as some books write that it also carries the proprioceptive sensation while as the another tract from the lower part of the trunk and lower limbs is the dorsal spino cerebellar tract which does not cross to other side of spinal uh, cord and ascends upwards to reach the inferior cerebellar peduncle in the medulla and through inferior cerebral cerebellar peduncle it enters the spino cerebellum and similar tract in the upper limb is called as cuneo cerebellar tract which also carries mainly the proprioceptive sensations from the upper limb and along with the along with the posterior spino cerebellar tract it enters through the inferior cerebellar peduncle into the spino cerebellum so you can see here then through the inferior cerebellar peduncle also enters this tract this is dorsal spino cerebellar tract and cuneo cerebellar tract that carry proprioceptive sensation from the lower limbs and upper limbs and if you see the fibers that enter through the superior cerebellar peduncle into the spino cerebellum or anterior spino cerebellar tract so this tract and rostral spino cerebellar tract is this tract the anterior spino cerebellar tract is from the lower limb and rostral spino cerebellar tract is from the upper limb and both these tracts enter through the superior cerebellar peduncle into the spino cerebellum and 
these tracts mainly carry the sensation of crude touch and pressure from the lower limbs and upper limbs. Some books write that they also carry proprioceptive sensations. So these all these tracts which go to the spinocerebellum actually are connected to the vestigial nucleus because we know that spinocerebellum contains the vestigial nucleus which is in the which is in the vermis and also have connections with the with with the interpositus nucleus but mainly the connection is with the vestigial nucleus of spinocerebellum now if i summarize here i said that dorsal spinocerebellar tract that comes from the lower part of the trunk and lower limbs carry proprioception that is it carries the information about the tension length pressure stretch of muscles as well as the position of joints so this information is carried by this tract that ascends upwards in the spinal cord without crossing to other side and it moves up and reaches the medulla upper part of the medulla from where it passes through the inferior cerebellar peduncle and enters the spinocerebellum while as in the upper part of the trunk and upper limbs it is the cuneo cerebellar tract that carries proprioceptive sensation and this tract also ascends upwards along with the dorsal spinocerebellar tract does not cross to other side and along with the dorsal spinocerebellar tract it also enters the inferior cerebellar peduncle and then goes to spinocerebellum so we have noted here that it is the dorsal spinocerebellar tract and cuneo cerebellar tract that carry proprioception from the lower limbs and from the upper limbs and go through inferior cerebellar peduncle to spinocerebellum the other tracts that come out or go to spinocerebellum are vestibulo cerebellar tract so it goes from the vestibular nuclei to the spino to the to the uh, vestibulo cerebellum but this tract goes through the inferior cerebellar peduncle and in return the tract comes from the uh, vestibulo cerebellum to the vestibular nuclei and this tract will be called as cerebellum vestibular tract and this comes out through the inferior cerebellar peduncle so there is to and fro tract between the vestibulo cerebellum and vestibular nuclei through the inferior cerebellar peduncle the one more tract that goes to the spinocerebellum is the tract that arises from the inferior olivary nucleus 
of medulla and this tract goes to other side of the cerebellum and ends up in the spinocerebellum by entering through inferior cerebellar peduncle and inferior olivary nucleus in return gets a tract from spinocerebellum which will be called as cerebello olivary tract so this is also to and fro tract between the spinocerebellum and inferior olivary nucleus so these are the tracts which pass through the inferior cerebellar peduncle now that was about the dorsal spinocerebellar tract and cuneo cerebellar tract now we come to anterior spinocerebellar tract and rostral spinocerebellar tract as we have known that anterior spinocerebellar tract enters the spinal cord and crosses to other side then ascends upwards to reach the midbrain and from the midbrain it crosses again to reach to the same side of the cerebellum so the anterior spinocerebellar tract crosses twice which is already known to us and this anterior spinocerebellar tract carries the sensation of sensation of crude touch and pressure and this tract goes to the spino cerebellum of the same side through superior cerebellar peduncle the rostral spino cerebellar tract is the tra tract of upper part of the trunk and upper limbs and this is like anterior spino cerebellar tract and this rostral spino cerebellar tract carries the carries the sensation of crude touch and pressure but from the upper part of the trunk and upper limbs and it goes along with the anterior spino cerebellar tract through the uh, superior cerebellar peduncle to the spino cerebellum and this tract also carries the carries the sensation of crude touch and pressure some books write that anterior spino cerebellar tract is also concerned with proprioception but majority of the books write that they particularly and mainly carry the sensation of crude touch and pressure from the lower limbs and upper limbs respectively to show it again here you can see here the ventral spino cerebellar tract or anterior spino cerebellar tract and rostral spino cerebellar tract they ascend upwards and through the superior cerebellar peduncle it enters the spino cerebellum and we know in spino cerebellum there is vestigial nucleus and interpositus nucleus the other tracts which come out of superior cerebellar peduncle is dentothalamic and dentorubral tracts these tracts they come out of dentate nucleus through superior cerebellar peduncle and we know that dentate nucleus is in cerebro cerebellum and cerebro cerebellum makes connection with the cerebral cortex where the thalamus so the tract will be called as dentothalamo cerebral tract which is a outgoing tract to reach the cerebral cortex and 
the other tract which comes out from the dentate nucleus that is from cerebro cerebellum is dentorubral tract and then from the red nucleus the tract will go to the spinal cord so it will be called as rubro spinal uh, tract but we have to understand here that the tract which comes out from the cerebro cerebellum that is dento thalamic tract it actually goes to other side of the cerebral cortex so it has it, it crosses it crosses to other side to reach the cerebral cortex and there is also a tract which comes then from the cerebral cortex to the cerebro cerebellum but that tract mainly enters to cerebro cerebellum through middle cerebral cerebe cerebellar peduncle so the main tract in middle cerebellar peduncle is cerebro ponto cerebellar tract so from the cerebral cortex to pons or the pontine nuclei and from pontine nuclei to the other side of cerebro cerebellum and the tract will be called as cerebro ponto cerebellar tract so there is a outgoing tract to cerebral cortex and incoming tract from cerebral cortex to cerebro cerebellum so that was about the inferior cerebellar peduncle and superior cerebellar peduncle now if i come to middle cerebellar ped peduncle then you can see here this is the middle cerebellar peduncle the only major tract that goes through middle cerebellar peduncle to cerebro cerebellum that is in cerebro cerebellum there will be dentate nucleus as i said so the tract is coming from cerebral cortex and it comes down to the pontine nuclei so from pontine nuclei it goes to other side of the cerebro cerebellum through middle cerebellar peduncle so this tract will be called as cerebro pontine cerebellar tract and by this connection the cerebro cerebellum uh, coordinates and cooperates with the cerebral cortex so there is a outgoing tract from cerebro cerebellum to the cortex and there is a incoming tract from cerebral cortex to cerebro cerebellum now what have we learned about spino cerebellum spino cerebellum as we know receives proprioceptive sensation from lower part of trunk and lower limbs by ventral and dorsal spino cerebellar tracts it also receives proprioceptive sensation from upper part of trunk and upper limbs by cuneo cerebellar and rostral spino cerebellar tract by these tracts spino cerebellum remains aware about the position tension and stretch and length of muscles it also remains aware about the state of tone and state of contraction or relaxation of muscles these tracts also keep spino cerebellum aware about the position of joints in relation to space and surroundings and in relation to one's body all this proprioceptive information is also passed on to cerebral cortex and both cerebrum and cerebellum as well as brain stem need this information 
to execute smooth coordinated movements damage to spinal cerebellum causes errors in force and direction of movements as well as causes errors in speed and amplitude of movements resulting in misdirected or disordered movements of head neck trunk and limbs coordination and smoothness in movements is lost speech and eye movements become jerky and disordered due to unawareness of position of muscles and joints patient won't even know which muscles to contract and which muscles to relax in response to different movements tone and tautness of muscles as well as posture get disturbed resulting in misdirected undershoot or overshoot movements patient has now problem in judging distances and ranges of movement which commonly result in dysmetria movements which were supposed to be smooth coordinated and well planned are now disordered jerky and halting because during act of movement moving of limbs cerebellum does not remain aware where the position of hands or arm is nor does it remain aware where position of foot or leg is so the movements won't be accurate and precise the one side or whole body may become shaky tremulous when person is moving his body or limbs he may not be able to walk properly and may sway from one side to other with tendency to fall talking also is shaky and jerky called scanning speech scanning speech also known as explosive speech or staccato speech is a type of speech in which spoken words are broken up into separate syllabi often separated by noticeable pause and spoken with varying force the sentence walking is good exercise for example might be pronounced as walk then pause ing then pause x then pause r then pause so there will be pauses in between the words additionally citrus may be placed on unusual syllabi if you ask the patient to perform rapid alternating movements he won't because it won't be smooth but in a steed defective jerky and slow not precise in range and timing when he try to reach target if asked to stretch his hands to get object then his hands and arm become full of tremors or jerks overshoots or undershoots the target damage to vermis or midline portion of spinal cerebellum leads to trunkal ataxia since the trunk is very close and near to vermis the patient won't be able to sit up of its own when lying on bed or if he tries to do so it will not be smooth at all and will sway side to side as far as his trunk is concerned if damage in spinal cerebellum is local is localized more laterally than is the, that is if paravermis is involved then there is more likely to be disrupt of fine movements of hands or limbs which are called as ballistic movements for example while playing piano or trying to hold objects or button unbutton his dress then such movements won't be smooth they may be jerky and clumsy uh, losing distance timing and range of movements as well as poorly coordinated thus if person tries to walk he won't walk smoothly 
but will sway from side to side with difficulty uh, to balance himself causing unsteady gait or ataxia. This is because spinocerebellum has problem in receiving the information about joint and position sense of limbs and of different parts of body which it could have used to modify descending motor commands from cerebel, cerebrum so as to facilitate smooth movement. The information and awareness of position of muscles and joints actually reach vestigial nucleus which is located in vermis and also reaches to interpositus nucleus consisting of globose nucleus and emboliform nucleus that lie in the paravermis. I must tell here that vestibular cerebellum connects with vestibular nuclei and tectum of midbrain that give out then vestibulospinal tract and tectospinal tract. These tracts keep head and neck and eye movements in balance in response to surroundings and in response to space and in response to visual and auditory stimuli. The vestigial nucleus then gives fiber also gives fibers to reticular nuclei of midbrain, pons and medulla which, which is called as cerebello reticular tracts which then give reticulospinal tract from these reticular nuclei that go down in spinal cord. The reticulospinal tract affect muscle tone that in turn affect movements of muscles and joints of body. Similarly, interpositus nucleus of paravermis of spinocerebellum sends fibers to contralateral red nucleus which is called as vestibulorubral tract that in turn sends down rubrospinal tract that mainly influences flexor muscles of body and limbs. Besides all these tracts, spinocerebellum also receives acoustic and visual fibers via superior and inferior colliculus connections. These tracts coordinate eye movements in response to sound and sight. The dentate nucleus that lies in the cerebrocerebellum gives fibers to thalamus of opposite side which is called as cerebellothalamic tract and then from thalamus to cerebral cortex which is called as cerebellothalamocortical tract. This tract keeps cerebrum aware about happenings in cerebellum and giving information to cerebrum as how to adjust and modify movements according to the need. The most important and only major tract that goes to cerebellum from cerebral cortex is called cerebropontocerebellar tract that sends modifying commands to cerebellum about movements of body. These commands are reinforced by cerebellum through extrapyramidal tracts to bring in desired tone and posture in muscles and in smooth conduction of movements. Thus we have known that extra pyramidal tracts are following vestibulospinal tract, tectospinal tract, rubrospinal tract, reticulospinal tract, corticobulbar tract, olivospinal tract which is from inferior olivary nucleus of medulla, the spinocerebellum uh, makes to and fro connection with inferior olivary nucleus then to spinal cord as olivospinal tract. One must note here that the major ingoing tracts to cerebellum or through inferior cerebellar peduncle and major outgoing tracts from cerebellum or through superior cerebellar peduncle. In normal conditions, these extrapyramidal tracts of brainstem, 
play a major role in contributing both excitatory and inhibitory effect on the muscles, thereby regulating tone and posture. All these major tracts cause muscle tone and posture to change now and then during act of movements of body. These tracts work alongside and in association with corticospinal pathway through anterior horns. Most of these tracts are facilitatory to tone.